Well, my name is Guilherme. I am from, originally from Brazil, but I have affiliations with Portugal and Italy as well. My PhD is in there. Well, my main object of study is international relations and political science based on international political economy. I do study Central Asian fragility and, of course, each Central Asian country now as uh, opportunistic as it is for this conference uh, to analyze Kyrgyzstan's uh, state fragility and how uh, the EU could be, if it is uh, for real, uh, a sustainable economic alternative. Well, uh, first I would like to know because fragility is a very, I don't know, dense and very volatile concept. What is fragility anyways? Uh, what constitutes its hierarchy, its governance? What makes it a country fragile? Well, there is, of course, uh, a concept that is uh, uh, brought by the Organization of Cooperation and Development that fragile states are those who lack capacity to offer public goods and offer them with less quality than successful states. So they do qualify a fragile state by analyzing these indexes of assessment that they use as violence, justice, analyze the level of institutions in the country, a governance, resilience, and so on, economic foundations. These six indexes I, I see because the OECD is a very neoliberal organization and they see economic development as their main base. It's not really a realist in the vision of international relations organization. Of course, they're going to analyze basically economic development and economic indicators. I substantially put here as the concept of fragility to a, a dichotomy between what? States that are structurally stable but require substantial changes. What country doesn't require changes in any capacity? And second, countries that structures are fragile as a whole and are entirely unable to recover from domestic international problems. I would qualify Kyrgyzstan, of course, in the first, uh, in the first category. Well, here, I'm, I'm sorry if you cannot really see the numbers, but I categorized, I took the, the rankings of fragility that this organization and that the Fund for Peace and OECD um, uh, uh, released, and of course, the five Central Asian countries. I'm sorry, that's Portuguese, but anyways. Uh, the first is Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. Kyrgyzstan figures started uh, in 2005, figuring at 65. Well, the higher you are in the rankings, the less fragile you, you are qualified as. So, it, throughout the years, it had an, uh, ups and downs. It was a roller coaster, of course. We had the, the Tulip uh, Revolutions in 2011, 2005. And then, and now, as of now, 2015, qualifies us as in, in 62. But how they qualify it? They analyze violence. How? These indexes, they put the whole uh, earth, all, all the countries, 200 countries in one assessment. Violence is the same thing in Kyrgyzstan as violence it is in India? Is violence in Kyrgyzstan the same as it is in Canada? No, of course not. So that's why we have to understand and to qualify Kyrgyzstan specifically and how the dark paths to development as the Eurasian Economic Union and how they can help. So that's why we bring uh, the Eurasian Economic Union to the table to analyze for sure what it constitutes fragility in itself. Uh, as I was discussing with my friend here, I had a quote from President Atambayev in 2014 that he chose the lesser of two evils. That is actually a quote from him. First was to not join and profit less. Why not? There would be slower development and more unemployment, but still, they would, they would not be attached to a new integrational project, a new of many others that have been happening since the 1991, uh, as uh, the, the, the break of the Soviet Union. And second was to join and harvest a long-term investment in domestic production, and therefore the hope, have the hope of faster development and less unemployment, and, as the president said, he, that what he wanted was more stability. As for me, as for an academic and a person, and I come from very far, so who am I to talk about Kyrgyzstan <laughs> coming from Brazil? But anyways, I could say from my experiences from integrational projects, which we, we have in Brazil, from, from Mercosur, 
we uh, definitely, if we could go back in time when we entered our our integrational project, we definitely choose, we should choose the first option to not enter and to not have shackles uh, in our feet that weigh three three hundred pounds each. So. Uh, because now, in 20 years after our, uh, our example of, of development, we have incredibly high tariffs, we have a, re a rise in unemployment, we have to abide by uh, Venezuela's gas deals and Paraguay's uh, migration. So Brazil has been, not invaded, because I've never used that word, but has been flooded in some kind of way by political and economic and social uh, diseases that are brought by our, our educational block because it doesn't work. It's not because it's not a great idea, it's because it just doesn't work. It does not have the political will, the economic capacity to function. There is a policy is created to function. It's not created to be written in paper. I can write here that this conference is amazing, but if it's not amazing, it's just not amazing how it's going to function if, if we don't make our part. That's a very basic, I'm just using very basic, right? Elementary examples of how this should function. So, taken by that, uh, I, I, I was reading papers and, every, and everything, and I got a quote from Russian journalist Dmitry Kizelyov, I assume. So he said that Kyrgyzstan has a choice. Before, that was before, uh, of course, the, the adherence in January. Uh, so it's 2014 there. Uh, so Kyrgyzstan has a choice. Following the path of Eurasian economic integration is the choice of national interests, of course. Unfortunately, we see today how countries simply disappear, <laughs> as there is no guarantee that Kyrgyzstan will also not disappear. Why disappearance? I'm not so sure what he wanted to say. If it's economic disappearance, if it's the country as itself, its independence, sovereignty, identity, Politically, I have no idea, but taking as in consideration uh, what he said also previously in 2011 about Belarus, about Armenia, and about Moldova, and some other post soviet based <laughs> countries, uh, he was he was, meant, he was meaning by a country itself. So may, maybe Kyrgyzstan would be integrated by Russia, or... No, I think he was speaking about the Ukraine. Kazakhstan, or Ukraine, thank you. That's what I was going to say, my favorite <laughs> example. And, yeah. Anyways, just as, as a Crimean example, so it's a vertigo of, of examples that just really clouded and, or maybe pressured the president of Kyrgyzstan to take this decision. So he obviously took the second decision uh, to grant uh, the country the possibility to enter uh, this union and have faster development, less unemployment and stability. I would say that it was, he is a very intelligent man of course, but it was a naive uh, perspective, but it was a choice for these people, in some sort of sense. Well, the aspirations, as we heard many, many times in this conference, I'm not gonna, you know, bore you with this, but uh, still, Kyrgyzstan, then after joining, was uh, seen as a centerpiece of development. The aspirations were what? My first analysis of, of what they wanted to have was economic recovery. A country that was, even before, even if it didn't uh, join the EU, the country was spiraling down a crisis, as the whole world it is today. So it was still failing in some aspects of its, of its economic uh, grounds. So the, the first aspiration was obviously having these different tariffs, having these different uh, re-exports, uh, the customs, uh, customs union, and uh, all these new plantations, and, new projects, it would be, of course, to, to foresee an economic recovery. I had a quote from my supervisor when I was doing my first year of PhD, and she, she's very skeptical about long-term development, and she studies Russian foreign policy, so of course she is. But um, she told me that Central Asia could never, and she's a little bit harsh, but Central Asia could never uh, uh, aspire for long-term development. It doesn't have the, the I don't know, the legs, the sustainability to do it. It, it cannot walk on, 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 on its own yet. So it still needs short-term um, facilitations. So, well, economic recovery cannot happen overnight. We know that. Uh, when we say short-term, I would say about from three to five years. 
which is still the first year and nothing is still really happening. But let's get that get to that in a second. So let's bureaucracy and commerce through borders, of course, why not? Uh, stability over fragility. Who doesn't want to be stable? Well, what does stable even mean? Stable mean getting out of a danger zone and just staying there between the danger zone and the development zone, just like hovering or just you know having progress, fast progress as Kazakhstan is having now. Uh, well, access of uh, 800 million, 180 million consumers, uh, consumers, rising massive production, and more symbiotic relations with Central Asian partners and Russia. I say symbiotic because it is a very biological term because it's symbiosis. Kyrgyzstan, in my opinion, correct me if I may be wrong, uh, cannot exist without Russian aid and therefore Central Asian uh, relationships. Well, uh, I would say that challenges for maybe avoiding or not being qualified as such as fragile as just fragility itself, it would be, the challenges to that would be because if it has more protectionism and less commitment to international integration. That's the challenges that the EU is facing now to Kyrgyzstan, and Kyrgyzstan itself is posing to, towards the EU. So it's being more a question of protecting its national interests and fighting against a system that should be helping them. It's like, why are you... I had 13% of tariffs, let's be very uh, here academic about it, and then now you're posing me 20%, so I have to give to you more and receive less. That is not what, what we want. So, more protectionism and less commitment to international integration. I was just talking to, to you uh, over lunch and we had like, a small discussion about it because in, I see international integration as very basic and very childlike thinking, but naive somehow. But international integration is about unity. It's about thinking as a group. It's about thinking as, of course, we, there is a leader, there is somebody that has more cap cap capability of progression. But of course, international integration has to be dealt not only by what Russia decides, it has to happen to everyone. So it's not Eurasian Economic Union, East Russian Economic Union, or Kazakhstan Economic Union. It has to be a union in, in itself. So it's a very basic concept of international integration, which we, we already have had, have had this example by presentations before. So cohesive integration is dealt by spillover effect, which we also had, which was very nice, rather than essential uh, domestic investment. <coughs> So it's the lower effect, of course, is going to happen by my, my concept of union. If you are united by a, a common good, of course, everybody has, are going to have not the same development rates, of course, but are going to have some level of expectations of better development. So that's maybe a challenge that's not happening right now. So exacerbated taxes and re-export re tariffs that shrinks the economy, as I said previously. Uh, it's pretty much self-explainable. Uh, taxes that are, were not there a year ago are, now, are here now. It happened to my country as well. When we entered in, in 1991 at Mercosur, we had our uh, different currency, we had uh, different uh, relationships with, the, with, with our neighbors, and then suddenly shifted, and we had to reintegrate this, this system and 80% of our, of our production had to go, had to be divided by other countries, and we were like, why? <laughs> we have to grow first, then to, you know, give uh, people what we have. So this is what this is about. So, and re exports highly dependent on the customs union, for sure. Well, I have a chapter in this paper that is called Criticism and Missed Opportunities. Uh, which I analyzed by, ma by macro and micro levels of analysis. I will be very quick about this, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, there's four points that I, point, that, that I put here. The first, that is hurt, hurting for business in a method of, of spillover effects, is the intermittence of the Russian rubble. We know that it fell 20% uh, since last year, and it's getting even worse uh, through the time, so we know Russian is our main uh, uh, economic partners, so that is a preoccupying situation for Kyrgyzstan at the moment. So Russia is too vital to Armenia and to Kyrgyzstan. There is a level of dependency that is extremely considerable here. So whatever happens to, to Russia in, in a political level and in an economic level, that is, of course, assuming 
uh, it's going to affect the country very harshly. It would affect Kyrgyzstan even if it didn't belong to the EU anyways. But belonging to the EU brings different and um, institutionalized uh, aspects to that. So I would say, and I probably will get a lot of criticism because of this point, but I would say the international community is just not invested at all. It just, uh, <laughs> Central Asia and Eurasia has had many integrational projects uh, before, and not all of them worked. Some of them had some progresses, some of them did not. And the Eurasian Economic Union is another Russia-led project that is built in itself to surpass a different image and I'm not so sure if the international community is invested or paying too much attention to this project in, in, any, in any capacity. And economic resistance of Belarus and Kazakhstan. A micro level of analysis, I will say that the, institute, the Eurasian Economic Union is not Eurasian. As I said before, it's not a union. It's in itself, you know, in all aspects, but of course. They're not pro-Eurasian. The Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Russia are pro themselves. There's a quote from Nazarbayev that he said that he was going to attach himself and his country alongside with it uh, to whom, whomever would help him. Whoever gives me aid, I will be pro them. So I'm pro Kazakh first, but if Russia doesn't want to cooperate, I'm just going to go to China for money or for investment. And we see that happening. And sometimes, in a very blunt and clear way, sometimes in a very hidden way. It's just happening anyways. Uh, Russian's foreign policy is dodging between Crimean and Syrian vertigo, for sure. I would say that Russian's foreign policy should be uh, somehow cautious with the consequences of their, of their actions. I'm not saying that in a Western position whatsoever. I'm just saying that in a very concise way where Russia should be focusing more uh, on... Because foreign policy has different layers. It can be dealt to security, it can be dealt to the economy. I'm talking about the, economy, uh, the, the economic way here. So the, the international community would be very critical about this, this, these situations of Russia because you know, we know Russia, what Russia does does not have the same effect what the US does, for example. The U.S. could invade Russia and Syria, and people would be like applauding them and like, "Yay, let's do put more troops there, save the world." If Russia does it, it's a criticism beyond words. So I would just state that as a, not as a critical way, but in a reflective way to think about what they should be doing instead of uh, making a turnaround and doing these situations. And by spillover, the desired EU evolution is fading to the background for the disaster. There's not much uh, substantial development and economic growth is that as it was uh, thought uh, in the first place for Kyrgyzstan. So I would say that it, was very, it is very recent. <coughs> as you said, we were talking as, about it <coughs> as well. It is extremely premature. We are talking about, can you imagine, uh, trying to, to, to tell a baby of one year old to talk? It would be like blah blah blah, you know, it just doesn't work. <laughs> so maybe we should wait more, maybe we should not, what should be done? And well, to finish, I would just like to make some remarks. Does that make Kyrgyzstan fragile by joining the Eurasian Economic Union? Would, would it be fragile in any ways? What, what are the implications? Do they even matter somehow for somebody? Does, it, does this matter for Russia or for the Eurasian Union in itself, for Kazakhstan? It does. It does. It does in three very simple ways, political, uh, sociological, and economic. Uh, political, it does have implications because if it is too fragile, there will be a lack of cohesion, you know, between the, between the Central Asian countries, uh, except for Russia and China, as it's, it's very dependent in, uh, on them. There is a multilateral form of governance. Kyrgyzstan has had, uh, as we had a uh, presentation by Borta and by other fellow participants, he has had a very layered uh, form of governance which helps them in difficult situations. Uh, as I would say, they are still recovering from presidential wounds and there is also the growth of Chinese influence. Sociologically, it would be, of course, because of the civil society is raising uh, in, a, in, a, in a form of 
Eurasianism that, that is growing. Uh, and economically, I would say this, the Silk Road Economic Belt, which of course we had a very nice presentation of Fabio talking about the merger. I'm not going to get into that, but I believe it will be for the best. Uh, we have in Kyrgyzstan a slow growing GDP of $7 billion. Very, very slow, the, 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 the smallest economy in Central Asia. Although, uh, if we understand by 2005 and 2015, we, have, we had from 27 to 82% in trade growth. So that is a good outcome. Not everything is bad, not everything is failing, not everything has to be done. Oh my god, we're over. No. <laughs> Okay, but it's still, of course, there is inequality <coughs> and some level of austerity. So I, my remarks would be that the business and it is the fragile state. What, if, what is the outcome? What happens now after the Iranian Economic Union? I would say that the business has to take a very safe backseat because uh, it doesn't have much of a say in itself and within the union and it could be heard very easily. So being fragile, imagine you taking your very precious porcelain and just throwing it to the ground, it's going to break. It's very precious. So why you have it in your hands, just pour your tea and sip on it and maybe wait for the best. I'm just making very <laughs> random analogies, but that's how I see it. So thank you very much. This is a portion of the got. I have one remark, uh, question regarding your, uh, one, uh, in terms of the macro level concerns or missed opportunities, you said uh, it's somewhat critical uh, uh, position of Kazakhstan and Belarus. Yeah, yeah. What, what is that? Yeah, the macro level. Yeah. No, I think it was. Sorry. About, about Kazakhstan and Belarus, that sure. they are these uh, half uh, critical... A resistance. Uh, resistance. Resistance, right? Okay. Is that, is that, what, how do you read that? How do I read that? For sure. Uh, well, economic resistance from Kazakhstan would be uh, on the borders. It, difficulties to, for trade, difficulties for implementation. For example, we had a presentation about food, uh, about food security, and after the EU, there's all these new regulations and implementations. And these populations, they were used to trade and, and cross the border with some level, some standards, and now they have to readapt really quickly, otherwise they're going to lose their jobs, they're going to lose their, their anyway. So, so does that fair, in, in, imply something for Kyrgyzstan? Absolutely, it implies in a negative way, of course, because they have to readapt really quickly and they don't have the, the tools for that yet. So can you imagine only having to trade your whole job in 24 hours and you don't know what, you have, what you're going to be doing next? So it would be very difficult for you to do. Thank you.